basics learning notes video. So in this video we're going to learn uh, notes, we're going to learn where they are, we're going to start to learn how to play them. Now what is a note? Most of us know a note is, so what? how do you say what that is? It's a, according to a dictionary I saw, Wikipedia maybe, it is a single tone of definite pitch made by a musical instrument or a human voice. I came up with a definition. It is a singular burst of sound made by a musical instrument or human voice. It can be long, it can be short. So over time you're going to be able to play notes on the bass as you get more and more familiar with the notes and how to play them. So let's dig in. Let's talk about the locations of the notes. But first, let's tune our guitar. That's done by playing the open strings and either using, uh, matching them up with the fret from the previous string that matches, that is supposed to match that string or with the harmonic, or with these new f tuners. They're not really that new. They've been around for years. But I like them the best. You can get them for $10 on Amazon or different places like that. Music stores, maybe a few dollars more. Pretty cheap. So you basically play the note, and it lights up at the correct note for that string. So that would be E, A, D, and G. The bottom note is E, the next note is A, the next note is D, the next note is G. We'll get into later what that means. What does it mean, E, A, D, G? But you match that with the letter that lights up here. It's supposed to light up as an E, but if it's not in tune, it will match up almost, maybe the arrow will not go right exactly to the E, it'll go beyond saying that it's a little higher, that's what it's indicating, and you need to detune it a little bit by going clockwise here. You go counterclockwise on this side to tune up, to raise the pitch, you go counterclockwise, or clockwise to lower the pitch. On the other side, you go clockwise to raise the pitch, and you go counterclockwise to lower the pitch. Because they're strung in a different winding. You know, these windings go this way. So that's just a little bit about tuning. Let's tune it. That looks right. That looks right. That looks right. This one is a little low, so going clockwise because I need to raise the pitch. There, it's just fine. Okay, um, it was already mostly in tune because I didn't want to waste time tuning my instrument. I did want to show you a little bit about how to do it. You know, whenever you play, you should always tune before you start. Okay, let's talk about something called the chromatic scale. The chromatic scale is a 12 note scale and it covers all of the notes that are available in a given octave uh, for playing the music that we've come to know and love in general. In pretty much all of Europe, uh, Americas, um, India as well, as I've learned. Um, so anyway, here's how we play that scale. E, that's the lowest string on the, we can start the scale at any point, but we want to start it at E right now, because 
because that's the lowest note on the bass guitar. E, F, F sharp, G, G sharp, A, B flat, B, C, C sharp, D, E flat, E. And then after E, it simply starts that cycle over again going higher. E there, that's actually the new start of a new scale. It is what is called one octave higher than the starting point that we had, which was down here. So that's how that works. Also play that on the first two strings because this string, this note, is the same as this note. So that's two octaves played in the chromatic scale. Notice it doesn't sound particularly emotional. Uh, it sounds more like uh, kind of mechanical or uh, maybe uh, it's not a very lyrical quality of music. It's kind of more like uh, walking up a ladder, you know, very uh, somewhat um, mechanical in sound. That's because, and we'll talk about this more later, it's in scales that that do not play each sharp and flat. They don't play all the notes in that chromatic scale. Uh, they play notes that are more pleasing. Just as an example, I don't want to get into this too deep, but we'll cover more of it later. Uh, you know how to sing do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do. It has more of a merry sound to it, you know, kind of. It's a little more pleasing to the ear. It's got that musical sound to it. However that happened, whether it's in our DNA or the way we were raised or both, uh, we can leave that for pondering later. Um, and so, that can make a good exercise as well. But I'll talk about certain things about this scale that I'll show you. Number one, F sharp. Every sharp can also be called a flat. Every flat could be called a sharp. Because E, F, F sharp is also G flat. When G, G flat means one note below G, or one semitone, as these are called in chromatic scale, one semitone note below G is G flat. One semitone note above F is F sharp. Well, it just so happens those occupy the same position. Now, there are different reasons why someone will call those uh, a flat or a sharp. I think it's got to do with a particular scale or you know a particular composition. Uh, I'm not sure all the details of it, but for simplification, I want all the notes of the chromatic scale to have one name for purposes of learning the bass and knowing where they are to keep it simple. But just know that those are two positions, or those can have two names. F sharp can also be G flat. And so I've divided that up. It's just the way I've done it for years and years. I was taught that by my music teacher is just call E, F, F sharp, G, G sharp, A. Call this B flat. 
flat, B, C, C sharp, D, E flat, E. And that's, that's so, so there are three that are called sharps, and two are called flats. E, or F sharp, G sharp, C sharp, B flat, E flat, okay? And so if you ever see a chord, if you're trying to play bass notes and you see a guitar chord called D flat, just know that that's the same as C sharp, and so on. Now also another thing about the chromatic scale is notice E does not have a sharp, it goes directly to F. F does not have a flat, it goes directly to E. The only other place that is is B goes directly to C. C goes directly to B. That's just how it works. And so um, now what we have because of now that we've gone through the chromatic scale, what we have is uh, we're going to talk about the uh, note name of, of a strings at different fret positions of all four strings. So the open position, which is playing them without any fretting, as we said before, that's E, A, D, G. I would say these are really the first ones you should learn. G, C, F, B flat. So on the third fret, one, two, three, we have G as we go up the strings. C, F, Why am I doing this? I'm starting at the fifth fret position. This is kind of like learning the main roads of a town area. You know, you learn the main roads, the main streets, and then you go start diving into the individual streets. It just helps to uh, get those down, especially maybe you don't have all of them memorized, but if you have a lot of these main ones memorized, you can walk down into those to find out what the name is. You don't have to go very far. So let's try fifth position. A, D, G, C. Okay, let's go to seventh position. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seventh fret. B, E, A, there's very few uh, sharps or flats. I think B flat was the only one. And also notice there is a dot here on these. Almost as though maybe the inventor of these instruments thought it was a good idea to have, you know, the main streets mapped out, metaphorically speaking. So what I would recommend is repeating those and going over and over them. E, A, D, G, G, C, F, B flat, A, D, G, C, B, E, A, D. You can learn the second one or any other ones, but I think learning for the dotted nose is a really good exercise and, and uh, a good thing to memorize those and get them familiar. Now let's talk about something called octaves, fifths, and thirds, and how to play all over starting with common places. So say an octave is, as we said, it's 
the next starting point when you've completed a chromatic scale. And so when we do a regular scale, I'll show you one, the famous Do, Re, Mi, Fa, Sol, La, Ti, Do scale. That's an octave, right? So E, what is the octave? It's the same note, only an octave higher, an eight, eight notes higher. A fifth is the same concept. You go up five notes on that regular scale and you have a third uh, here is a third so we have third fifth octave the third in this case at least the major third is a G sharp Minor third, as a sneak preview when I talk about this later, is actually G. It's got the sad sound. And as we talk about, the, uh, the major third has the happy sound. Well, the way many people's ears perceive it due to DNA or their culture or whatnot. So let's talk about something called the relative number system. We started using that when we were discussing thirds, fifths, and octaves. Notice we were counting in a scale. Two, three, four, five to get the third and the fifth. So um, we uh, we find these notes be, uh, because they're relative to the root, but we have a system for doing that. Instead of going, because we don't have to do as much mental gymnastics to say the rel you know, the third, the major third of D is F sharp. We can just say it's three notes. It's three. One, two, three. In this case, we include the one. One, two, three. There are other situations like the, the fret. When you're open, that's zero fret. So the first note you play is not one. Hopefully that doesn't confuse you, but we don't always start with one meaning the same thing with every case in our musical discussion. But here's D. We're going to call it one because we're just in the key of D. And instead of saying, well, the relative, the third off of that, we're playing a major third, we have to play F sharp. Therefore, in G, what is our major third? And you're just left with that question. You're not using numbers. And you have to think of it. Well, the answer to that question of, you know, how do you come up with the right answer to that is you don't. You don't try and figure out that B is the relative third, um, unless you want to. I mean, you might be very advanced, but you can just go one, two, three. And you look there, and because you've been learning your notes, that's that's B. But you can just say that's three. My hand is here. I go up two, three. Okay. So that's what I call the relative number system for notes. Is we simply count up the scale to get that. And so then, um, then see. That way, it's easier to find what notes you're looking for. You base it on the root note. And as I said, the root note is typically the first note. Uh, there are cases when people are playing a chord that maybe the first note is not the root note. It's the note that um, the bass pattern is based on. 
So the bass pattern you're going to play, um, the root note is the first note typically, and we call it one. Now let's do some basic patterns. One five, one five in the key of E. So, one five, one five in the key of A. One five, one five in the key of D. One five one five in the key of C. Now one five one five twice in all of those keys. It's starting to sound a little more like music. One three five. Key of A. Three five one three five one three five. Okay. One three five eight. One five eight five. That's how the relative numbering system is used in bass patterns, but bass patterns are played along with chords in a band, and the chords in the band use all of those at once. So the bass is going, but the, the piano or um, the piano or guitar is playing a major third, a major chord. My A is just an octave lower, one three five. So you play that, and you'd be like, or you might just go like this, or you might just go while they go. Here's the bass. Anyway, so it, this one, three, five, this numbering, relative numbering pattern system is used in basic patterns and chords. Now I want to cover that major or minor third a little bit. Major or minor third. One, two, three. Notice that third is flatted because that's the major third, the unflatted third. That's the flatted third, that's the minor third. So that's the kind of more happy go lucky sound. how that's not quite as happy-go-lucky. It's more of a serious sound. So flatted, typically um, major or minor, especially in more basic music, is referring to the third. Actually, uh, there is also major and minor is a term that's also used with the seventh. And all it means is you have a flatted seventh. Often, seventh chords are so common, the flatted sevenths, in like uh, blues, uh, soul, rock, that they just call it the seventh chord. Because this music, which is more like in jazz, the major seven, it's the unflatted seventh. So 
that's a little outside of the scope of what I'm trying to cover here. It's going to, we'll go in depth with that later. I don't exactly know when or where. I believe it actually uh, is covered a little more in another, another um, video I have called Base Basics Accompanying Chord Progressions in a Band. So look for that video and that's actually uh, kind of uh, the next step that you would go through after watching this video. Uh, you kind of need the stuff in this video before you start going into that video. You should get familiar with this. You can watch them both at the same time too. Um, like on two different computers. No, I mean like, you know, interchangeably. So, um, so what we want to do as, you know, this next video I'm talking about we'll cover in more in depth is we will be playing our patterns uh, and runs, which I'll talk about in a minute. We'll be playing the bass accompaniment uh, that fits and is compatible with the chords that are played in the chord progressions that many songs have, uh, especially of the more common genres of music, the more popular genres of music. Okay. Also, don't leave these tuners on. Uh, they, their battery will run down unnecessarily. And if you turn them on and start playing, they will think they're supposed to stay on. Now, I will be right back and we'll start the next section. Now we want to talk about expanding uh, what we've learned and uh, utilizing that to play what I call runs, walks, and riffs. Those are various patterns. I think they could all be called patterns. Um, or they're a little more involved in patterns, especially riffs. So let's do uh, an example of a run and a walk. I think a, a run is just faster. I've always just used the word uh, bass runs, but there is a kind of a walking thing that's done on jazz, like. that idea? 
idea, uh, that's one of them. You can go. So that's kind of a couple little riffs together. Uh, what you'll see in a lot of bands uh, is, you could call it riff-based music. Um, it's a riff that is very dominant and it's played along with a chord progression. Uh, a real famous example would be... Uh, that would be very busy, uh, very boring if they just played a chord there because it's in the key of E right there. So they're playing a riff over the key of E. And if they just played that along with the words, and the words are fitting in between the riff, it's hard to sing and play at the same, the same time, but it's kind of like, it's getting, it's getting near dawn. Shining blue on you. It's getting you on. Something like that. And so it's a it's different than where a lot of traditional or more traditional songs, they just have chord progressions and then the singing has a distinct melody. This has kind of got a riff that is doing kind of a, a counterpoint with a voice. And so uh, uh, it only becomes more typical sounding when you get the chord progression. I've been waiting so long to be where I'm going. See, that's more like a, just a typical chord progression. So that's, uh, I've heard it termed riff based music. And so, and uh, basically, we're using runs, walks, and patterns to accompany chord progressions, and once again, uh, refer to that that uh, accompanying chord progressions video to get more into that. Uh, it's called Bass Basics Accompanying Chord Progressions. I'll try and put a link in here somewhere uh, uh, below. So anyway, that, that's uh, a little more talking about uh, runs, walks, and riffs, and giving more of an example of those. Now, uh, what we haven't uh, covered very much, um, and I'm going to, is basically different ways of playing your bass. In other words, how to play the notes on the bass. Well, you obviously put your finger down on what you've seen me do here. I don't know if you've been seeing what's going on on the right hand or noticing it that much, but I'm using a finger plucking method. There are other methods though. Uh, sometimes I used to have a, a bad attitude toward people who picked with a bass, used a bass pick. You know, like, oh, that's not legit. Let me tell you, I changed my mind. It, it is totally legit. If you want to use a guitar pick to ba play the bass, that's fine. Um, there are certain things I even use it for. When Sometimes I can't get the speed I need on the fingers, and it's a, just a real fast song. Like, say, something like really, really uh, aggressive and they got a really fast bass line, maybe just single notes, but I can't play them fast enough, I'll switch to a pick. And so uh, there was a guy named, uh, there was a band named Yes. It was one of the most progressive rock bands in history. And the bass player was one of the most famous bass players in that era. His name was Chris Squire. And he played with a pick. 
And one reason for playing a pick with a pick is like if you're a guitarist, maybe you play with a pick. And so um, um, you're, that's how you want to start on the bass because that's what you're used to. And I think a lot of bass players use picks. Uh, I've seen a lot of ones that are not as famous and they use a pick to great effect. Um, I mostly pluck with my fingers. But uh, I use a pick sometimes. And then there's another option is, I did this a lot when I was young. I played with my thumb. I mean, I didn't know what I was doing. I just picked up the bass and started learning it by myself. And I would just go like this. And uh, you can do a lot with that. But then I would mix my fingers. Pick with your picking with your thumb and or your fingers. In other words, you can pick with your thumb and then combine your fingers. Do whatever suits you. I have one more option in case you're not already. In case I haven't whipped this to death, it's a thumb pick. Understand the nature of the instrument we're dealing with. It has a longer scale. That's the reality of it. It has a longer scale, um, except for short scale basses, it's still a longer scale than guitar. Um, and so the fingering is going to be more stretched out. If you've got really big hands, which I don't, uh, you're probably not going to notice it as much. But down here, for example, I might not be like on a guitar. You can easily go like that. On these lower notes that are stretched out, you know, notice they get closer together as you go up the neck. I use my little finger, even though on a guitar I would go because it's a much shorter distance. So that's just the reality of a bass. Um, you have to understand its origin, where it came from. This bass, the four string bass, uh, some other video I talk about five string and six string and four string, but I'm using four string and where its origin, what it was based off of was the upright bass, which is two with exactly these notes. The Fender Company, um, I think it was actually the leader of the Fender Company named Leo Fender. Him and his people invented what's called the precision bass, which just meant we're going to have a bass that's got frets so everybody doesn't have to worry about being out of tune. You know, it's got frets. You don't have to get the note exactly right. You can just press there and you got the note right. They shrunk it down from something that's roughly this tall and had a body this long. And so that instrument was actually even much longer. I don't think it had a 34 inch scale. It had a huge scale. This is much more navigable in my opinion than an upright bass. I've played them briefly and uh, again I don't have big hands. Bottom line is uh, its history is different and the realities of this instrument are different for fingering than a regular guitar. So. Uh, we do have the smaller scale option that if you're really getting frustrated or for heaven's sake you don't want to injure yourself if you start playing too much and stretching too much and you feel like you're being injured stop immediately they do have this short scale bass option now some of them they don't have the sustain that the longer scale one does the shorter scale I believe is a 30 this is called 34 inch scale. The uh, short scale is I think a 30 inch scale or I think some of them are 28 inch scale and I believe they have a medium scale called 32 inch scale. Now 32 would probably have the least impact on sustain but honestly the 34 um, 
or the 30 inch scale, you know, the, it's the basic short scale. Uh, it's really not that bad. I think some people, even myself, subconsciously might get hung up on looks like, or might get hung up on, well, I should be able to play the 34 inch scale. Why? Because all the other people do. And you might be thinking, do I really want to worry about that and possibly risk an injury? Maybe my hands are just too small. My hands, I've noticed though that they stretch. They really do stretch. And so when I was first playing the bass, after not playing it for a long time, I couldn't play the notes that I can play now or reach the things that I can reach now. Um, also, one last thing I want to talk about, there's uh, ways of playing patterns which include plucking, but there's also a little detail called hammer on and pull off. You don't want to rely exclusively on that. It can muddy up your playing when you put too much of it in, but you can also get better at doing them more solidly. Like if your hands are stronger, then you can go and it's less distinguishable from that. Uh, and pull-offs. Sometimes when you have a few of those in there, and then slides. So I'm, on here I'm using a hammer and a pull off. Hammer, pull off. Hammer, hammer, pull off, slide. So anyway, um, I just wanted to include that. Um, hopefully this video uh, will be helpful to you. Thank you. I really appreciate you watching, especially if you watched all the way to the end to hear this. So, okay. Bye-bye.